to the heart of what this day is about, which is to introduce ourselves to some of Eckhart's writings and to do so in part through the mediation of poems that uh, John and I wrote, inspired by Eckhart's texts. So there are copies in the back, or if there were, some of them are gone. Um, and let me just say a word about these books. You can find this out if you read the introduction and the afterword. But these are not Eckhart's words, but they are Eckhart's thoughts. And if you are serious about wanting to check that out, you can go to the very back. And there is an index with all of the poems listed and the sources, so where the inspiration for these poems came from. Occasionally, but only very occasionally, uh, the poem will be a line of Eckhart's with almost nothing altered. Usually it's a phrase, a thought, it's his way of thinking put into modern poetic form. It's very funny because when we published the first book, the, um, which has been sort of a runaway bestseller in the, this field of religious poetry, um, somebody wrote a very unkind um, review on Amazon. One line, I bought this book thinking it was meditations, but it's only poetry. Uh, uh, you know, where do you begin with that? But I simply responded and said, these are meditations in poetic form. And they've been widely used um, as prayer support for people who are doing centering prayer, all kinds of ways. So uh, it's not Eckhart's words as he uttered them, but it's Vintage Eckhart, inflected through uh, modern, the idiom of contemporary poetry. So one seeing, that's where, you know, one eye, our eye and God's eye uh, are one eye. One seeing, one knowing, one loving. And we begin with one seeing, because for Eckhart, seeing was really at the heart of knowing, and knowing was at the heart of loving. The Franciscans, looked the, the other way around. They said you begin with love, and that teaches you how to know, and that teaches you how to see. If you want to understand, and we have a Franciscan here, a third order Franciscan, Chick. Thank you, wonderful that you're with us. Um, it would be wonderful to do a day on Francis, and perhaps we'll do that down the road and make sure that you're here to help us understand Francis. But think about, that's a, a very easy way of thinking about these divergent paths. They, they weren't contradictory, but it was beginning in a different place. The Franciscans begin with love, compassion, and move toward knowledge. The Dominicans begin with knowledge and move toward compassion. And that's Eckhart's way. But, you know, we have the phrase in English, as we do in German, I see. I see what you mean. I see what you mean. What does it mean when I say, I see what you mean? Not I see visually, visually what you mean. What does it mean? I understand. I understand. Mm -hmm. To see something properly is to understand it. Our, the visual sense has long been given a kind of primacy in the way we orient ourselves in the world, above hearing, above tasting, smelling, and so on. And one could dispute that, of course. One could dis dispute that. But seeing for, for Eckhart had a primacy. We have to learn to see. And for him, the seeing was about radiance. That's my word, not his. He talks about the shining. When I finished my, this recent book of poems, and I told the, the editor we were talking about, the publisher, the title, and I said, I'd like to, I'd like to call it The Shining. He became laughing. <laughs> He hadn't seen the movie, see, or read the book. He said, what do you mean, John? It's a great title. He said, you can't use The Shining. You just can't. Okay, tell me about it. Okay, I got it. I'm a little slow on contemporary culture. Uta helps me with that. The great movie goer, Uta. Where is she? Where is she at? Oops. Okay, one scene, and ratings. And I said this earlier, it's about this little spark the front line, a little spark. It's not a huge flame within any of us, but all we need is a little spark. And that's God. That's the divine. And it's there in you. It's there when you don't know it. It's there when you don't want it. It's there when you can't see it. All God sees is that spark. 
That's all God sees. You know, in a way, that's just good parenting, right? All the parent sees is the gift of the child. That's all the parent sees. Well, that's in their good days. Right? But it, what it means to be a good parent, what it means to be a good God, is to continue to look at the gift that was given at the beginning and to bring that gift forth, to bring that spark forth. So we'll start with a poem, if you want to reach the highest wisdom. And these are all um, in the books, one of the two books, so I've listed that uh, at the bottom on the back page of these. Quotation. We should each have a book of the quotations. We'll, we may not get to all of these today, but we're going to start. We have the first two already we've looked at. So we'll come to quotation three in just a moment. But here is the poem to begin, one scene. If you want to reach the highest wisdom, refuse everything you know. Everything you know, everything. Refuse everything you know. Abandon all you aspire to be and seek the darkness of the lowest place of all. Become nothing. Well, oh, these are his words, not in this form, but this is this is the heart of his thought. This is in one of our poems. Become nothing, and there God will pour out the whole of God's self, who is all, with all God's strength, and you will see in the light you long for. If you want to reach the highest wisdom. Refuse everything you know. Abandon all you aspire to be. And seek the darkness of the lowest place of all. This is one of the great themes of Eckhart. Humility. Humility. Which comes from, from the word hummus. The earth, the dust upon which we tread. Take the lowest place. Jesus has a parable about this, right? If you come to a feast, don't sit at the guest at the, uh, the, the host's right hand. Where, where should you sit? At the foot of the table, at the lowest place, because then the host can invite you up and will invite you up. Right? Begin at the lowest place, which is what you know best. Eckhart's very clear about that. We ignore this. We fear it. We sometimes even despise it. We don't want to consider ourselves the lowest. Eckhart would say it's very freeing. It's very freeing to start at the bottom because there's only one way to move, <laughs> and that's up. Yeah. Seek the darkness of the lowest place of all. Become nothing, and there God will pour out the whole of God's <coughs> self, who is all, with all God's strength, and you will see in the light you long for. That's a God. You will see, you will see, you will begin to see in the light you're, you're, you're desiring in that dark place. That light will come and illumine the dark place in your life. That's a, a radical step of hope. And in a way, these poems, I would say, are poems of hope. Hope in the midst of hopelessness. Light in the midst of darkness. Compassion in the midst of cruelty. These are the principles of the wisdom teacher, Jesus of Nazareth, as he wandered from village to village, telling little stories. Never preached a long sermon that we know of. Even the Sermon on the Mount, pretty short, really. And that's a an amalgam of things put together, two, di two different versions. Luke's is much shorter. Jesus is a wandering teacher of wisdom, as Eckhart was a wandering preacher of wisdom. So let's turn to the first Eckhart text. Can you have it in front of you? If you don't have it, look for someone near you who does, and we'll get a copy to you at the end of the day. And here is the quote. And this is a wonderful way to begin because you can almost feel in some of Eckhart's sermons the way he was writing. He didn't spend his time 
sitting in a study, all of always, on Saturday nights, writing his sermon. There are a few pastors here who know what I'm talking about. I live with one. No, he did sometimes. He probably had leisure enough to do that, but he was always thinking, as every pastor is, about the sermon on Sunday at the grocery store in Hannaford's, you know, or doing your laundry in the, in the morning, or taking the dog for a walk, or whatever. We cultivate wisdom where we are, Eckhart would say. So you don't need to have a quiet place to discover God. In fact, in one of his early talks, his, the friars asked him when he was 26 years old, he'd, he'd come as he, he was the prior of the communion airport, and they said, we want to collect the talks that you're giving us each morning. We want to collect them because they've, they've been so helpful. And it's a little book called The Talks on Instruction, uh, which is available in many of the collected writings of Eckhart, sometimes under different titles, The Talks on Instruction. And in the second talk, he, he, he starts this way. He says, look, some of you have asked me, and he often starts with questions. Some of you have asked me, it's, is it easy, is it best to find God in the church or in my private room? Now, what do you think somebody in Eckhart's day would have said? They all expected him to say, yes, of course. I mean, we're giving our life to this work, and, and we're, we're, we're devoted to the church, and we're devoted to our prayer, and so on. And that Eckhart answers, he says, well, if you ask me this question, I say, by no means. Because God is everywhere. And if you can't find God everywhere else, outside of the church and outside of your cell, you will, your monastic cell, you will never find God in the church or in your room. That's powerful. That's powerful. That's talk number two from the talks on instruction. So here's, he's thinking about his sermon on the way to church. Some of these sermons would have been transcribed while he was preaching. He probably preached from notes, and they probably would have been written, as was the day, not on parchment, too expensive, too costly, too difficult, but on wax tablets, which could be wiped off then, revised, edited, and reused, and then written down once he had it right. But as he was preaching, some of his sermons were collected by the, in the convents uh, and circulated for their own use. Not all of them, but some of them. This one may have had that kind of origin, that it happened on the way to church. As I was coming here today, I was wondering how I should preach to you so that it would make sense and you would understand. What a great question. What a great way to start. I, I was asking myself, how can I reach you? How can I find you with this, with my work as a preacher? Then I thought of a comparison. He's always thinking of comparisons, you know, always. He's always thinking of an image, a metaphor. Because for him, God is metaphor. And finally, if you want to know God, you have to hate God. He says that. You have to hate God to find God. You have to hate the God that you cling to in your conceptions to find the true God who is always behind, beyond all of that, all your thinking. That got him in trouble, by the way. <laughs> you can imagine if you heard that without a clarification, that would get you in trouble. Yeah. Maybe you shouldn't be on the board of deacons. <laughs> then I thought of a comparison. And that's what all good preaching, good communicating is about, comparison. <coughs> There is no direct communication between any of us. We, we always mediate everything we do through words, which are instruments, which are finite, which are limited, which can expand. If you could understand that, you would understand my meaning on the basis of all my thinking and everything I have ever preached. Uta, what would it be? What a great line. I'm gonna, I thought of a comparison. If, if you can understand this, you'll know everything I'm trying to do. Can you imagine hearing that? I mean, it must have been electric for people who knew this is a wise man. We have him for many you know, weeks and months and years. He'll be teaching us. And then he comes and says, look, I'm going to give it all to you right now in one comparison. Here it comes. 
And you better bet that people were on the edge of their, well, they weren't on the edge of their pew, because there weren't pews. They were standing. But they were atten- leaning in, probably, to listen. <laughs> the comparison concerns my eyes and a piece of wood. And then you say, what? <laughs> what? Right? That's outrageous. Everything that you teach can be summoned, summarized in the eyes and a piece of wood? Are you, you haven't gotten enough sleep. <laughs> have you been drinking again? What is the problem? This must have outraged people. You know, um, I edit poetry, which I mentioned that, and if I read a collection of poems and nothing really surprises me, it's, it's not going to go far with me. A poem that matters has to startle somewhere. Not every poem can do that, but a good poem, a good piece of art, startles us. It makes us think. It asks us to pause, to linger, to, oh, I love the word, ponder. What does it mean to ponder? What does pondus, what does pondus mean? Wait. It, it causes us to stand still and think again. My eyes and a piece of wood. If my eye is open, oh, here. If my eye is open, it is an eye, right? My eye is open, it's an eye. It works like an eye, right? If it is closed, it is the same eye, right? It's, it's not seeing anything, but it's the same eye. Try it. So your eyes are open, it's an eye. Close your eyes. Nobody will take anything from me. Close your eyes. It's still an eye, right? You know it's an eye. You know that the eye is still there. Okay, how can this summarize all his wisdom? It is not the wood that comes and goes. It is not the wood that comes and goes, but it is my vision of it. Now, pay good heed to me. If it happens that my eye is in itself one and simple, and it is open and casts its glance upon the piece of wood, the eye and the, and the wood remain what they are, and yet, in the act of vision, they become as one. Whoa. Whoa. There's a lot here. What's simple? And it is simple, but Eckhart says this is the heart of all of his teaching. Everything that he was given to teach as a learned preacher is in this comparison. What can it mean? When you close your eyes, and the piece of wood is no longer there to you, you don't see it. But it's still there. And it is one with the piece of wood when the eyes are opened again. What can this mean? What can this mean? What do you think? The relative and the absolute. The relative and the, the absolute. The middle way is having one foot in each, and that's where real wisdom lies. Beautiful. The relative and the absolute, the middle way is having one foot in each, and that's where wisdom lies. Wonderful. In a way, the relative is that our eyes open and close. Sometimes we see clearly. Sometimes we see darkly. Sometimes we can't see at all. Sometimes because it's dark around us, within us, Sometimes because our eyes are closed, literally or metaphorically. But to keep our eyes open is to realize, and this is an understanding of light and perception that modern theorists would shudder at. This comes from Aristotle. It comes from an ancient way of imagining how the eye works without a, a real theory of light, right? Actually, a modern theorist would say there are no colors, really. Color is in the perception of the eye. It's not an absolute thing. Eckhart might have made a lot of, have found a lot of traction with that. But what he's saying here is that it's moving between the relative and the absolute. The absolute is everything is one. But the relative is all I see are all of these different things, people, things in the world, all of this distraction, all of this multipl- multiplicity, but fundamentally, everything is one. 
Now, how do we come to understand that? What might be the learning from this? Simply put, keep your eyes open. Stay alert. Right? Stay awake. Wonderful line from the poet William Stafford, Bill Stafford. It's a good thing for awake people to be awake. <laughs> right? Keeping your eyes open doesn't mean you see anything. It may mean that you see nothing. I'm always shocked, as I was recently, when I was in Wisconsin, and my sister-in-law wanted to make Vietnamese egg rolls, ve vegetarian egg rolls. And she said, well, we get the rice wraps at the store. I said, I, they, they don't have those in Wisconsin. <laughs> they just won't have those in Wisconsin. They won't have them in Hannaford's. Sure they do. You walk by them every day of your life, but you've never imagined cooking with rice wraps, and so you've never seen them. But now that I say it, the next time you're in the Whole Foods store or the Hannaford's, and you go past the Asian section, you'll see rice wraps. And you'll wonder, what could I do with a rice wrap? How could I cook with a rice wrap? You see, everything is present to us, but we are not present to everything. This is Eckhart's point. Everything is potentially present to us. And finally, he would say, love is the possibility that's always within your reach. But your grasp is not always attuned to love. Do you see what I'm saying? The wood is always there, but you have to open your eyes to see it. The heart is always alive, but you have to yield to its compassion to experience it. You must learn to see before you can know and before you can love properly. Pay good heed to me. If it happens that my eye is in itself one and simple, and, is and it is open and casts this glance upon the piece of wood, the eye and the wood remain what they are, separate, and yet in the act of vision, they become as one. They don't become one. You're your eye is not the wood, and the wood is not the eye, but they come, become as one. There's a connection. There's an engagement there. There's a bond there, as he understood optics in his own way. So let's see how we can spell that out. And here, the theme we're going to be themes we're going to be looking at take us, I think, into a whole different way of imagining. Your only delight. This is all about how we see ourselves. How do you see yourself? Because Eckhart would say, you can't tell somebody how they should love others if they don't love themselves. That's ancient teaching from Torah, from the law of Moses, which Jesus simply quotes when he says, you must love your neighbor, how? As yourself. It comes from, interestingly, from the book of Leviticus. And it's right in the middle of the section of Leviticus about stoning the sodomite, stoning the gay man, killing a gay man who's caught in the act of loving another man sexually. Right in the middle of that comes a startling point where Moses, the writer of Leviticus, God, in Orthodox tradition, says, you must love the stranger, the neighbor, the one near you, as you love yourself. What does Jesus say when he quotes these two great commandments? The Shema, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And you must love your neighbor as yourself. What does he say then? Every Upon these as if, you, as, as if yourself. You must love the neighbor. The whole law, he says, depends upon these two commandments. I think this would make the issues of sexual orientation, our debates about sexual orientation, a lot easier for people who point to Leviticus 17 and say, look what it says here about, about homosexuality. And I would say, well, look in chapter 19. And Jesus seems to say, if you follow this law, you've fulfilled the whole law. So let's start with Jesus. 
and reminds us that that's the heart of the law. An amazing statement. Well, it's loving the neighbor as the self. And Eckhart knew that that's the hardest thing for us to do. It's what keeps therapists in business. <laughs> you know, therapists would just, they'd have no business if we all figured our lives out, if we didn't have problems, if we didn't have difficulties. And I'm saying that with respect, because therapists have saved my life a few times. Really. How do we really understand how difficult it is to love ourselves. And the chances are, um, Eckhart says this at one point, when you realize that you can't love other people, the real problem is you can't love yourself yet. You don't love yourself enough. Because if you loved yourself enough, you would have plenty of love for everyone else. And he says, look at it this way. If there are people you can't love, the issue is not learning to love them better. The issue has to be learning first to love yourself better so that you can love them. Because you have to look at all the darkness in your life, and there's plenty of it. Now let me speak for myself. I've got enough darkness to occupy me for a long time. And that's a good thing, because the darkness reminds me that I am not the center of the universe. That I need you, and you need me that we need each other, to remember that that radiance is never gone, even when I can't see it. So my work for you, Paul, is to say, Paul, you are the shining light of God when you're in a very dark place. And you will be in a dark place. And I hope I'll come and be able to say that to you. But your task, Paul, is to say the same to me. Mark, you're in a deep depression. And let me tell you, there's a radiance in you that has not gone out. And I see that radiance. So it begins by claiming the beauty of our own self. And this is not pop psychology. This is Jesus teaching, which goes back to Torah, to the ancient wisdom of Moses. And is found in all religious traditions in some form or another. This is the perennial wisdom tradition. This is not New Age, pop psychology, mysticism 101. This is the heart of the gospel of love, which Jesus preached, which Buddha preached, which Lao Tse preached, which Martin Luther King Jr. preached, which you are called to believe and to preach. You're only the light. There is in me a radiance. That would actually be enough for the whole day. You know, let's just we'll spend the next half an hour quietly just reflecting on that. There is in you, just say quietly to yourself, there is in me a radiance. Just say quietly, there is in me. Say it so that your neighbor can hear it. There is in me a radiance. There is in me a radiance. It's important to be able to say that. To be able to claim that. Some days it's really easy, but a lot of days it isn't easy. You wake up in the morning and it's the wrong side of the bed. And why is it already seven o'clock? And I have this what to do today? I don't think I can do it. There is in me a radiance. You know, if, if you have lipstick, write this on your mirror where you get up and look, the first place you look in the morning. And if you don't have lipstick, borrow some. <laughs> you know, you can always wipe it off. I'm serious. Write this on your, on your mirror. There is in me a radiance. It would start your day differently if you began with this phrase. There is in me a radiance. It's not all about you, but it is, first of all, about you. If you don't show up to your own life, how can you expect to show up to anyone else's life. Let's be honest. If you don't ground yourself in this conviction that your life is beautiful, you will only see ugliness around you. It's all you'll see. So when Uta hears me carping about something that was recently said or done in the political world or whatever, I can sometimes feel her gentle way of saying, okay, I, I, I got that. Now let's, let's move on. 
And it's really nice. <laughs> there is a you are waiting. There is, now look to the persons on your left and right and say to them, there is in you a radiance. Just take a moment. Look at your smile. Look at your smile. Does that feel good? You know what, this is, this is a call to worship. This is the call to worship. What if we began our services tomorrow morning? Just with that. Turn to the person next to you and say, there is a new radiance. I see it. Beautiful. Look at that. Oh, I see touching. This is, this is what we're made for. And we're so shy about it as Americans. You know? We're so shy about this. About saying to each other, what we hope someone will say to us, there is in you a radiance. There is in me a radiance. You're reminding me why my whole theology, my own way of being, is about the baptismal scene where God, where the words are, you are my beloved. Yes. Mm. You, and that church for me is the community yes. that reminds yes. itself to say to everyone and to the self, you are my beloved. Beautiful. She, let me just repeat this. That's so important. The center of, her the, of your theology is the words uttered at Jesus' baptism and at the transfiguration. You are my beloved. You are my beloved. Eckhart has a dozen, no, ten sermons on that theme. You are my beloved. And for Eckhart, the question isn't about the beloved God, Christ. In, in Christ, he would say, well, that's that's the incarnation in Jesus, but that incarnation is in each of us. Each of us is given the promise, you are my beloved. You are my beloved. You are my beloved. And to hear that for ourselves, I am God's beloved. There is in me a radiance. There is in you a radiance. That would be enough for the day, really. You know. It's a shorter day. <laughs> I, I could skip lunch. I would not prefer to do, but no. You, you have it all there. And I, I'm serious about this. If I take some lipstick or a marker, put that on your mirror just for a season and see what happens. When you get up in the morning and you go to wash your face or brush your teeth and you see right there in front of you this, this truth of Eckhart, which is the truth of Jesus. It's the truth of Buddha. It's the truth of every teacher of wisdom through the ages and all around us. You are my beloved. There is in you a radiance. And your work is to find out about that today. And then to find out about that in others. To be curious about the others and to tell Lucy there is in you a radiance. I see it. I see it. Ah. Okay, the poem isn't over. <laughs> that never ceases. There is in me a radiance that never ceases, and if I had eyes to see into the darkest depths of my heart, I would know there it is. If I had eyes to see into the darkest depth of my heart, <coughs> I would know that this inner spark, this funkline, this little spark, is all you, God, ever see of me, whether by day or by night, and this alone is my one and your only delight. There is in me a radiance that never ceases, and if I had eyes to see into the darkest depths of my heart, so you know, it's not on your good days that this is true, when you're up, in your best moods, it's true then, but it's not that important then. It's really important in the dark times, when you can't see this, when you don't believe it, when you need someone else to hold on to you and tell you this truth, whether it's your spouse, 
your neighbor, a fellow church member, your therapist, the guy at the corner store, the gas station attendant. It's going to come in unexpected places where someone will look at you and say, you're beautiful, despite yourself. <laughs> you know? You're really beautiful. Yeah, you're ornery, you're crotchety, you're impossible, and you're beautiful. You know, the one time we laugh in church, well, we laugh in church at other times, but the, when is the, the time in the rhythm of different services where we laugh? Funerals. We laugh at funerals. When people tell stories about the quirk in that person that just drove you crazy and now you miss it for everything in your life because you can only remember it, right? It's the, the stories of what makes us distinctive. It's the radiance that we don't always know to see when somebody's among us, that we miss when they're gone. And if there is a kind of reincarnation that happens, that happens in funeral services, when we remember the life of the one who was radiant in our midst. Actually, the first service I ever participated in, I led a funeral in this church 25 years ago, long before Ruth and I came here, for a wonderful Outward Bound instructor, Buzz Tripp. Oh my word. Remember Buzz? Yeah. Were you at that service? Yeah. Here in this church. Yeah, we had summer with Buzz and Linda for many years. When my kids were little, and when Buzz died of brain, a brain tumor at an early age, early 40s, I think. Mm -hmm. Linda asked if I would conduct a service, and there wasn't a place big enough in Camden except here. And, and the pastor then, which is Archie McCree, yeah. said, of course you can do the service for Buzz here. So I conducted the service here. And it's a wonderful story because the reception was in this room. And on this piano, Linda brought one of Buzz's beloved trucks. Remember Buzz? Yeah. He loved trucks, old trucks. And she had a little toy truck. And my daughter, who was at the time about seven, says, I really miss Buzz. Where is he? She says, he's in the truck. <laughs> he was. He was in the truck. His ashes were in the truck. <laughs> right here. Right here. Must have been about 1997 or 8. No, 96, 95. Anyway, radiance. We laugh at funerals because we remember the radiance that we long for. We're given this day, right now, today, to discover that radiance in ourselves. And as we discover it in ourselves, we'll become a little bolder to find it in the one next to us, in the one we love, the one we like, and the one we don't like and don't love. The radiance is in them too. That this is the heart of Eckhart's dangerous wisdom. That this wisdom will not let you stay with your complacencies, with your comfortable, small world experience. It will invite you, it will not force you, it will invite you to see the radiance shining in everyone, in every creature, and Eckhart would say, in everything is God. There's another long quote, and we won't spend a lot of time with this one, but this is a prelude to the next couple of poems, and then we'll take a break. Those who have God essentially present to themselves grasp God in a divine manner. And to them, God shines forth in everything. For everything tastes to them of God. I love this. Have you imagined that everything could taste like God? It's, our, it's one of our strongest senses, our taste and our smell are much stronger than our seeing and hearing, which we can lose. Our, scent, our smell is fundamental. And if you can't taste, you can't smell. I don't know how that works, but it's true. If you lose your taste buds, you can't smell. Does somebody understand the physiology of that? There is an explanation. It's not magic. But it's one of the strongest, and it's not very developed in us, but in primitive peoples, in ancient times, you had to be able to smell. I was reminded of this 
we were at a marvelous gathering last night of folks from the church. And Mike talked about a bear giving off his scent to warn you to get out of the area. And I said to him, what does a bear smell like? And Mike said, you'll know when you smell it. <laughs> this is a big bear. This is a grizzly, right? That they have a very powerful smell. And the bear deliberately, as you were telling us, went upwind of you so that you were downwind so you would smell the bear and get out of the way. Interesting. Well, our smell used to be so attuned, we had to be able to smell to avoid bears and to find other things that we need it, right? Well, we don't use our, our olfactory sense very much. But for Eckhart, tasting God was crucial. And where do you taste God, and how do you taste God? Eckhart would say, well, in the Eucharist, of course, you taste God. But the Eucharist is happening everywhere, all the time. Because God is in everything that is. And insofar as you taste God in the other, you are taking the Eucharist, which after all means thanksgiving. For everything tastes to them of God. Now this is the key here for, for Eckhart. Those who have God essentially present to themselves. Eckhart did not mean this in a devotional sense. He did not mean this in a dogmatic sense. He did not mean you have to get your theology worked out. You have to believe the right things about God. No. He's saying, if you can open yourself to love, put love where you read God. If you can open yourself to love and be present to love, you will, in a divine manner, you will begin to see God, love, shining forth in everything. That's what people say about the saints. Those who simply, and I mean that in the old-fashioned way, people who simply see a radiance all the time in the world around them. A Mother Teresa, who was full of doubt about the dogmatic truth of the church, but she said, when I see the poor, crippled beggar at the side of the road, I see God. I see Christ. I encounter Christ. That's what kept her going. And then after her death, when her letters and journals were released, people were shocked that she could say, I don't believe in God. I can't believe in God. But she never gave up this experience of seeing the presence of Christ in the broken person on the streets of Calcutta, struggling for a breath, hoping for an act of kindness. It's like those consumed with a real and burning thirst, who may well not drink, and may turn their mind to other things. But whatever they may do, in whatever company they may be, whatever they may be intending or thinking or working at, still the idea of drinking does not leave them so long as they are thirsty. We must learn to break through things and grasp God in them and form God in God's self powerfully in an essential manner. We must learn to see God in everything. We must learn to see love in everything. It's an incredibly powerful commercial. It's been, I haven't seen it for a while, but it ran for four or five years. And I don't know who the actor is, but he's called the most handsome man in the world. Who is it? I don't know who it is. This, and he's bearded, and he's very... The Dos Equis commercial. And he's got beautiful women hanging on him. He's, you know, he's just cool. He's just totally cool. And at the end, he turns to the camera and he says, Stay thirsty, my friends. Dos you never forget it. Stay thirsty, my friends. Stay thirsty. Eckhart would say that. Stay thirsty, my friends. Your thirst will help you find your way home. Your thirst for what is real will help you find your way home. You, if you do not long for it, you never will find it. If you do not long for love, you'll never find it. So it's not just being thirsty, it's finding the source of that thirst. That's Eckhart. And I love this. If we could have this love present to us, 
and grasp love in a divine manner, to that person, love, God, is shining forth in everything. The key isn't finding God in things. It's actually be, being letting that reality be present to us first. Letting that love be present to us. That's why Eckhart would say it does matter how you see, and it matters how you know, if you want to love. You can't start, he said, with loving. You first have to see love. And you have to know love in order to, well, as he will say, become love. Okay. A couple more poems. Love shines. Love shines even as my thoughts about you fade. Not a bad place to begin. You know, for me, at least, I'll be honest, I'm not always thinking about God or love. I'm not. Most of the time, I'm stuck in my own little cycle of petty grievances. You know, of feeling wrongly injured or not appreciated or, you know, you know that. Okay, I'm only talking for me. None of you have experienced that? Okay, you have. You know what I'm talking about? You know? You know that. Well, look. Love shines even as my thoughts about God fade. Love is still shining. Love is still shining. For you are always present to me beyond what I think or feel or do. And when I turn to you, and accept you in this simple way, I have you in every way and in all things, and you shine out in me as a love that cannot cease. That is the heart of the matter. If we could really understand, if I could really understand that I am radiant, not all the time, but that there is a radiance in me that's never not there. And if you can help me remember that when I've forgotten, because I will forget, like, very soon, as will you, that you'll need someone else to tell you, you are radiant. To look you in the eyes and say, you are radiant. Not just to say it, hey, Lucy, radiant. You're radiant. Yeah, no. <laughs> Lucy, you're radiant. Yeah? To receive that gift, is to, in a way, receive what's already there. Eckhart would say, we're not becoming something new. We're always new. We're not, it's not about renewal for him. We'll get to that later today. We're always new. Every moment is this new discovery of our radiance. And Eckhart would say, everything depends on this. Because when we look away from this truth, we will find ourselves in a muddle in every part of our lives. And some of those muddles will get us in a lot of trouble or leave us feeling very alone. But it will not gainsay the truth that I am radiant, that there is a spark in me and in you that will never cease. What a gift. For you, God, love, put love there, for God is love, that's in the Bible. I didn't make that up. Eckhart didn't invent that. God is love. For you are always present to me beyond what I think or feel or do. Love is always present to you and beyond what you feel or think or do. Beyond your confusions, your doubts, your worries, your anxieties, your inability to love or your refusal to love, beyond all those things, love is always present to you. Always present to you. And the question Eckhart would say is, the, the question is, are you present to that love, to that radiance in you? That's your work. That is our work, to be present to what's already present in us, which God has never stopped seeing, because God made you radiant. And God wants you to find out about that. And as you find out about that, 
God allows you, invites you to find it in other people who need to discover that in themselves, who don't know about it all the time, just like you don't. Right? Imagine if the 90 of us here could begin to do a little of that, a little more of that today in our lives when we go home, when we leave this place, and tomorrow and the next day, and could remind ourselves, you know, we, we have a kind of bond. We're going to spend a day with Meister Eckhart here and with each other. So the next time I see Bob, whom I haven't seen for years, I'll say, Bob, you're radiant. You're radiant. I just see it in you. I've known it for years. You forgot about it? It's okay. I'll tell you. You're radiant. You're radiant. We have this little gift you know, to share, not just with these people here, but uh, with people in your life. Love shines. Love shines. That's the heart of it. Love shines. You are radiant and love shines. So I got one more flame my life. Also from the book of the heart. Flame my life, and we'll take a break. That's a pretty powerful image. Remember the image of Meister Eckhart in the Cologne Cathedral with fire uh, at his feet? Often the image of Revelation, the image of uh, at the Pentecost, the story of the Pentecost, as we hear it, read about it in the book of Acts. The Spirit is descending like flames of fire. And what are people given? The gift of tongues. What was the gift of tongues? Do you remember the story? They're able to talk to people whose language they don't know. How do you talk to someone whose language... You, have you been in a place where you didn't understand anything that they were saying, and they couldn't understand anything you were saying? Have you been in a place like that? And you know what? How do you communicate? How do you communicate in that kind of a place? You mime, yeah? You use your body. And the thing you might do if you really wanted to find, to touch someone, is you just give them a hug. Hugs are irresistible, ecumenical, <laughs> non-national, and somehow dangerously true. Just giving someone a hug. It doesn't have to be a full body hug. Just touching them. I, I will miss, it's changing now in Germany, but it used to be, Whenever I would meet my friends, male or female, young or old, Paul, stand up. This is how I greet you. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. We would kiss each other on both cheeks. The Belgians do it three times. Why, I don't know. <laughs> they do three times. Yeah, I do two, and then my Belgian friends come back with a third, and I'm always startled. <laughs> it's like we want to make sure you got it. It's a beautiful gift. You know, it's not a, it's not a full French kiss. Doesn't have to be. But <laughs> leaning into somebody, touching their face, face to face, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful image. And it doesn't depend on language. Flame my life. Give me the gift of tongues to communicate with those I cannot understand. Maybe the best thing we can do is a handshake or the European embrace, the double or triple kiss, whatever it might be to lean close to somebody, to come close to them. You know, it's interesting because Germans, Lucy, stand up. This is the way Americans would talk. I talk with you like this. A German will talk to you like this. And it's a little unnerving at the beginning. You think, my gosh, did I have garlic last night? I'm not sure I want to be that close. You had garlic last night. No. Uh, there's a different sense of space. And in a sense, coming close to each other, the gift of Pentecost is the gift of coming close to the stranger. That's how I would translate it. It's given this weird idea that people could speak all of the languages of those gathered for this Jewish festival in Jerusalem. But really, it's about meeting the stranger and speaking from the heart to their heart. That's what it was all about. That's what it is all about in our lives. It's about meeting the stranger and finding the flame that connects us. So, flame my life.
teach me, and this is Eckhart's theme, at the, he says over and over again, everything begins with humility. We don't know much of anything. And most of what we do know <laughs> isn't helpful, isn't useful. So begin by saying you don't know anything and be surprised by what you can discover. Think about that. If you begin with someone you've known for many years and say, okay, let's assume that I really don't know this person. How would I get to know them today? What assumptions could I set aside that would create an open space for us to overcome perhaps a long-standing argument that we've had for 40 years? Someone injured me 40 years ago and I haven't let go of the grievance. And every time I see them, that's all I see. What would happen if I could let go of that and create a space to come close to them as you and I came close to each other to greet them in a different way? Teach me the humility of knowing that nothing I can do can grasp, nothing I can do can grasp the love that is your one and ever hidden work. That's a card. This radiance is hidden not because it's not available, but because we don't see it. We don't know how to look for it. There's a line from that familiar song, looking for love in all the wrong places. It defines so much of our lives. We're looking for love in all the wrong places, and we'll make mistakes all along the way. But when we learn to look in the right way, we find love everywhere. And that's Eckhart's teaching. It's not trying to find love. It's trying to look lovingly. Learning to look lovingly is more important than trying to find love. Try to become love rather than try to find love. It'll change your life. Teach me the humility of knowing that nothing I can do can grasp the love that is your one and ever hidden work. And let me in my darkness come to see this nothing as the radiance that burns until it finally blinds me and so flame my life with the radiance of love until I finally see. That is great wisdom. Flame my life with the radiance of love until I finally see. Not until I'm given something lovely to look at, but until I finally see. Flame my life. What a prayer time that would be to say, flame my life, God, so that I could be the radiance that I'm looking for. Teach me the humility of knowing that nothing I can do can grasp the love that is your one and ever hidden work. It's not about you. It's not about you. It's not about your capacities. It's about something given to you that you need to continually find out about. And let me in my darkness, in my difficult times, you know, let me in the dark night of my soul, there let me come to see this nothing, that I can do nothing. Eckhart would say, finally, God is nothing. Nothing. God is nothing. God is not a thing. God is nothing. And your nothingness is the place where the radiance waits for you there all the time. When you can let go of that self-image and trust the radiance that's deeper than that self-image and come to see that this nothing has the radiance that burns until it finally blinds me, blinds all my ways of seeing wrongly, you could say. And that's right out of the Sermon of Eckhart. And so flame my life with the radiance of love until I finally see. If the top of your mirror says, I am radiant, the bottom could say, you know, flame my life with the radiance of love until I finally can see today in this place, right now. You are radiant. We're going to eat together.
together. And before we do that, where is Jean? Jean, come on up. Jean Day, who is the um, administrator of the Shields Fund, is going to say a few words about the mission project that we are devoting this day to. I'm receiving nothing for this day. All of the, the volunteer labor here that makes every church a little miracle of love that it is, this one among many. And this church has long had an outreach to people in great need in our community. Some of you may be here who've received help from the Shields Fund. It's um, a remarkable, uh, an engine of generosity and compassion in a world that is in desperate need. And so whatever you give generously today goes to the Shields Fund. And Jean, say a word to us about the fund. Thank you. This is hard for me to talk about because it's something that just resonates so deeply in me that it comes from a deep place of feeling. And when I get to talking about stuff, then I'm back up in my head. So um, bear with me um, because I'm just moved by all that we've shared already today and how it is about being a part of the radiance. Um, and I'm excited to have the opportunity to share the radiance with you in the work that I do with the SHIELD Mission Project as the administrator of that program. Um, we have had the beautiful gift of a legacy back in, what was it, 2001, that the congregation made the decision to convert into some kind of a gifting fund for the community. So we help people who reside in Knox County and in Lincolnville, since that's also part of our school district. And we help with all kinds of things, whether it's fuel expenses, rent, um, utility expenses, health needs, car repairs, whatever. And it's when other agencies or other resources aren't available to assist, then SHIELD steps in and offers assistance. Um, it's a powerful mission to be involved in. And it's extremely gratifying when you hear from the folks we have helped uh, and hear their stories and know that we have helped them to move a little bit forward in their journey and to overcome circumstances that could be extremely daunting in many situations. Um, many of the families we help, I find myself marveling at their resilience and their ability to get up and face the day when I, referring back to what you were talking about, when I grumble and complain and um, maybe have a little pity party at home about some foolish little thing that's going on and then I get some of these requests that come in. Um, it's very humbling to be a part of this whole program. We have helped roughly about 155 families this past year. We've worked with 20 different agencies in the community. We have worked with about 50 different case managers. Um, and all of them have different expectations and approaches to how they work with the clients that they refer to us. But that is also part of the learning journey is to be able to accept those differences in perspectives and, um, and needs. So I would just like to encourage you to be part of this mission and give from your radiance and give generously today for this work that we're involved with here at the church. Thank you very much.